Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us, episode 63, The Origins of the Space Shuttle. Before we get started this week, I have a few quick notes I'd like to throw in here. I'm often loath to include stuff like this at the end of an episode, since I think it breaks the rhythm, so it's been a while since I've mentioned some boilerplate stuff. And with the natural break in the narrative, this seemed like a good place to have a brief reintroduction. Hi, my name is J.P. Burke. When I started this podcast in May of 2016, I was just a guy who was passionate about space and desperate to move out of New York City. Well, I'm still passionate about space, but these days I'm putting that passion to work at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. I spent two years writing support software for the Earth observation satellites Aqua, Aura, and Terra, and have recently moved over to the Restore-L mission. As part of that team, I'll be writing ground system software for NASA's first satellite refueling mission. Oh, and the satellite wasn't designed to be refueled, so we're going to need to get a little creative. It's been a crazy couple of years. And I suppose this is where I should remind you all that everything on this show is my personal opinion and does not necessarily reflect the views of NASA or my employer. There are a few different ways to get in contact with me if you have a question, feedback, criticism, or just want to say hi. Probably the most reliable in the long term will be email. You can reach me at jp at thespaceabove.us. That's jp at thespaceabove.us. I'm also pretty responsive on the show's Twitter feed, at Space Above Us. I dropped the out of the title to save a few characters. You can also swing by the show's Facebook page, facebook.com slash thespaceaboveus, though it's very possible that may no longer be the case by the time you hear this. I've been trying to figure out how to deactivate my personal Facebook account, but still keep the show page running, but I might just call it a day and shut the whole thing down at some point. Sorry. I also want to apologize if you've ever written me an email and I didn't respond to it. I discovered that there was a lengthy period of time when my needlessly complex email system was dropping messages. So if you wrote to me and I didn't answer, please write again. At the time of this recording, there are a few different ways to listen to the show. We're on iTunes, or Apple Podcasts, or whatever they want to be called these days, Google Play Music, Spotify, Stitcher, and YouTube though the video is just the show's logo with the audio playing. The YouTube channel also has a video of me talking about the podcast at the Goddard Engineering Colloquium, if you're interested. And of course, you can always point whatever podcast player you like at the good old-fashioned RSS feed on the show's website. Personally, I use Beyond Pod, but it'll work with whatever podcast player you like. The website, which you can find at thespaceabove.us, has links to the various listening and contact options I just mentioned. It also has a brief about page with some information about the show and myself. I'm planning an FAQ and book list as well, which should be up pretty soon. I've never paid to advertise the show, though a friend did once buy me a round of Facebook promotion, so it's pretty much just online ratings and word of mouth. If you enjoy the show and think your friends and family might enjoy it too, help spread the word. It's really effective and it means a lot. Also, if you're so inclined, Positive iTunes reviews are supposed to be pretty important for getting new podcast listeners. I'm not sure if that's true, but I at least enjoy reading them. Alright, that's more than enough of a reintroduction. Let's get back into it. Well, here we are at long last. After 62 episodes and just over 24 hours of audio, we've gotten through the primordial Mercury, the often omitted X-15, the underrated Gemini, the victorious Apollo the forward-looking Skylab, and the harmonious Apollo-Soyuz test project. Including the tragedy of Apollo 1 and the uncrewed launch of Skylab, we have covered 35 missions. It can feel like a lot, and it is a lot, but this next phase of the show is really going to drive home just how much was completed in a crazy small period of time and a crazy small number of missions. That's because it's time to talk about the Space Shuttle and all of its 135 flights. I sort of suspect that if you're listening to this podcast, you're at least familiar with the basics of what the space shuttle is. But for now, we're going to play a little dumb, take a look at some historical context, put ourselves in the shoes of NASA leadership in the late 1960s, and try to figure out what in the world, or off of it, we should do after Apollo. I'm going to pull the curtain back a little here and say that I wrestled a lot with this episode. The topic of the origins of the space shuttle is enormous, 
and easily could have been a few months of episodes on their own. I wasn't sure what the right balance would be between what was interesting, what was mandatory background information, and what level of research I could manage in my limited spare time. So here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to kind of go for it and take you all along for the ride. I'm sure I'll miss a few things and make a few mistakes, but we've got 135 missions to fill in the gaps. And if I missed anything, well, you've got my contact info now. If you'd like to dive way, way in depth on this, I recommend the book The Space Shuttle Decision by T.A. Heppenheimer, which is actually available for free on various corners of NASA's website as either a giant HTML document or a PDF. Just pop the title into your search engine of choice and it shouldn't be hard to find. I especially relied on the Space Shuttle decision for this episode since it did a great job forming a coherent series of events out of a messy and confusing time. There are also several books written by Dennis Jenkins that get into eye-watering and completely fascinating levels of detail. The first volume of Jenkins' book Space Shuttle Developing an Icon covers the early shuttle designs and was a little too much even for me, though I'm sure his stuff will be invaluable as we get into the missions. Anyway. NASA had a problem. In 1964, just a few short years after the nation had committed itself to a lunar landing, President Johnson asked NASA Administrator James Webb essentially, hey, what are you guys going to do after Apollo? This is a scary question. The space nerd in me would love to have Webb just say, obviously we go to Mars, but that's why they don't pick me to be the NASA Administrator. Picking a goal like that so far ahead of time just increases the time available for critics to chip away at it. It also undermines the current big goal. If NASA comes out and says Mars is next, then suddenly the moon seems less important. Maybe Apollo starts to get less support. Then maybe it gets cancelled altogether. And then maybe the Mars thing eventually gets cancelled too, because each new Congress and President gets a chance to poke at it. No, in public at least, you want to stay laser focused on the task at hand, especially when taxpayer money is on the line. But even if the question was politically scary, 1964 probably was the time to at least start figuring it out. If not in a big public announcement, then at least internally. One thing I've learned from doing this show is just how early you need to get the ball rolling on space projects. In 1964, a lunar landing looked doable, maybe as soon as 1967, just a few years away. So maybe even if the question wasn't, what do we do after the first lunar landing, NASA had to at least consider what the plan was after they were done putting a bow on Apollo. Webb dodged the question, putting his years of experience in the political arena to use, but internally, early work was already in progress. Fast forward a few years, and in the same time period that Apollo astronauts were first laying bootprints down in lunar regolith, many at NASA were making a push for a future defined by four major elements. It was a vision for spaceflight in the 1970s, that was being developed in the 1960s, using a lot of concepts that had been around since the 1950s. First was space stations. The upcoming Skylab was nice and all, but it was just a start. NASA was hoping to have several large space stations in both equatorial and polar orbits around the Earth and a smaller space station around the Moon. These stations would serve as research bases, logistical centers for spaceflight, and who knows, maybe even perform on-orbit repair and manufacturing of spacecraft. To move things around between low Earth orbit, geosynchronous orbit, lunar orbit, and everywhere else in between the Earth and the Moon, there would also be a space tug. A space tug would be a space-only vehicle, like the LEM, that just, well, tugged stuff around in space. Pretty simple concept, but really useful. From what I can tell, this was a sort of vague idea that encompassed both permanent space-based vehicles as well as single-use kick stages. For destinations past the moon, NASA had their eye on a nuclear rocket engine. This isn't that crazy idea you may have heard of involving using nuclear bombs to push a spacecraft along, though that would be really cool. Instead, a nuclear rocket engine is basically a nuclear reactor. But rather than heating up water to make steam to drive turbines to generate electricity, it would instead heat up hydrogen, which would then be directed through a nozzle and out into space. Such technology held the promise of incredibly efficient space-based rocket engines that could propel crews and robots all around the solar system, 
There was actually a lot of progress made on this concept in a project called Nerva, but we won't have time to get into that today. So that's it. NASA's new space vision. Oh, right, the fourth thing. Yeah, I guess we're going to need some sort of resupply vehicle that can ferry stuff back and forth between low Earth orbit and the surface. Some sort of space shuttle. I don't know, we'll figure it out. Hard as it is to believe, the vehicle that came to define NASA for more than 30 years really was sort of an afterthought, or at least not thought of as the main player. And I mean that less to downplay the shuttle and more to highlight the grandiosity of the original plan. As budgets shrank, inflation rose, and wars ground on, it was the only part of the system that found anything close to strong support across the board. This is cutting through years of meetings, political battles, and plenty of Washingtonian inside baseball, but every time NASA presented its big plans, the reaction was basically, yeah, that seems like it's going to cost a lot of money, but that space shuttle part sounds pretty okay. There were a few reasons for this. For one thing, NASA wasn't exactly presenting the most unified front. Sure, the Johnson Space Center and the Marshall Space Flight Center were all gung-ho for a robust human spaceflight program. But there were, and still are, plenty of people who look at the resources required to fly humans in space and wonder how many robots and scientific instruments could that money buy. For another thing, while a lot of decision makers saw the value of spaceflight, some begrudgingly, they weren't sure about committing to another huge effort like Apollo. In the past, NASA had talked about trying to get to Mars as soon as the mid-1980s. But that was far from a budgeted and approved endeavor. But you know what you get if you take a space shuttle, a bunch of space stations, space tugs, and a nuclear rocket engine? Well, throw in a Mars lander and you've got yourself a Mars program. The sentiment was, if we were going to go to Mars, then the American public should at least have a chance to clearly understand what they were getting into. But perhaps most importantly, a lot had changed since 1961. The shiny post-war glow of the 1950s was firmly in the rearview mirror, the Soviets had been soundly defeated in the space arena, and the conflict in Vietnam had flared up into something far uglier and far costlier than anyone had imagined. Outside of space nerds like myself, and dare I say like you listeners, there just wasn't much appetite for a vast new space program. It's also important to remember that while NASA is a firmly established institution today, nothing said we had to have a space program. I can easily envision an alternate history where after a few successful lunar landings, NASA was trimmed back down to something more resembling its NACA origins. But even if America wasn't on board with the whole system, a space shuttle, that could work. There wasn't much interest in a space station, at least not yet, which had sort of been the whole point of the space shuttle, but NASA was quick to pivot. Such a vehicle had been envisioned purely as a station support spacecraft, but it could certainly do more than that. If it could deploy spacecraft more cheaply than current methods, or even repair them, that would be especially appealing. Spaceflight was clearly becoming an important part of our civilization, but the cost of each flight was almost intolerably high. According to the price tags I found in Heppenheimer's The Space Shuttle Decision, in today's dollars, each Apollo mission costs somewhere between 2 to $3 billion a launch. Apollo is clearly a bit of a special case with its multiple elaborate spacecraft, but the Saturn V alone would be around $1.3 billion. Even the Saturn 1B was around $300 million. If NASA could come up with a new system that was significantly cheaper, then it wouldn't be that hard to find support. This line of reasoning leads to an obvious thought. Hey, what if we could use these rockets more than once? What if it didn't take a ton of effort to prepare a launch vehicle, and when it was done it just landed back at a specific place rather than somewhere in a big ellipse in the middle of the ocean? What if you had a reusable spacecraft with wings? This was actually not a new idea. In fact, it actually predated the capsule-style spacecraft we wound up with by a number of years. Austrian researcher Eugene Sanger had put a lot of work into the concept of a rocket-powered plane flying at Mach 10 and skipping along the upper atmosphere in 1933. His vehicle concept never really went anywhere, but it feels oddly familiar today. Back in 1952, Collier's Magazine collaborated with aerospace superstar Warner von Braun to produce a flashy glimpse into humanity's spaceborne future. 
Von Braun, with the help of Collier's artists, delivered a vision of multiple giant space stations gently rotating to replicate the effects of gravity. The stations would be packed with meteorologists, reconnaissance specialists, and researchers, all using their high perch to make observations that were impossible from the ground. Depicted next to the station was a giant winged spacecraft that served as a resupply vehicle. For many people, this was their first encounter with the concept of a space station and space shuttle. It was an idea that stuck. And of course, starting in 1959, along came the X-15. We talked about the X-15 way back on episodes 10 and 11, but let's do a brief recap since it was really influential on the shuttle. The X-15 was an experimental rocket-powered aircraft designed to validate aerodynamic theories about vehicles moving at hypersonic velocities. The hypersonic flight regime starts at around five times the speed of sound, or to get technical, really, really super duper fast. Wind tunnels of the time couldn't reach hypersonic speeds, so the only way to really validate the theories was to go and do it. The X-15 wound up flying 199 times and providing a wealth of data. Several of the lessons learned applied directly to the space shuttle. In order to fly the X-15 to extreme altitudes, control schemes needed to be designed that could seamlessly transition from aerodynamic control surfaces to reaction control thrusters and back. The X-15 also demonstrated the high angle of attack entry that the shuttle would eventually use. By basically belly flopping into the atmosphere, the vehicle produced a lot more drag while still in the tenuous upper atmosphere, slowing down before hitting the soupy stuff closer to the ground. Not an easy trick to pull off since control becomes very difficult, but it meant that you didn't need to build the vehicle out of unobtainium or something to survive the thermal stresses. And speaking of those thermal stresses, the information gathered on X-15 flights would go a long way towards planning the thermal protection system of the space shuttle, even though the X-15 did use a totally different technique to deal with the heat. Here in 2018, there are some interesting thoughts about redefining the boundary to space, so maybe this number will increase in the future, but the X-15 made it to space at least twice, though only on a brief visit. It hopped up and fell right back down. It just didn't have the horizontal velocity necessary to get into orbit. But a potential successor that would reach orbit was on the drawing board, the X-20. You may better remember the X-20 by its ridiculous name, the Dinosaur, since it used dynamic soaring. Ugh. The X-20 never came to fruition because the folks in the Air Force who were pushing for it could never quite figure out a good military justification for it, but today it looks pretty familiar. A small single-seater spacecraft with a wide delta wing, it would launch atop an expendable booster. The modern-day Dream Chaser spacecraft actually looks pretty similar to it. If you're not familiar with what a delta wing is, honestly the easiest way to describe it is a big triangular wing like the space shuttle uses, which I guess is a bit of a spoiler. When the dinosaur <laughs> was ready to return from orbit, it would use a technique similar to the X-15 to survive the rigors of re-entry. In the early 1960s, something that did actually fly was ASSET, which stood for Aerothermal Dynamic Elastic Structural Environmental Tests. I think I'll stick with ASSET. This was a small, uncrewed, delta-wing space plane, about six feet long. Six of these vehicles were launched on suborbital trajectories that topped out at around 13,000 miles per hour. ASSET used special metal shingles in a thermal management strategy similar to the X-15 and was focused on studying the thermal aspects of re-entry. Out of six launches, five flew successfully and one was actually recovered. A few years later, a similar vehicle flew but with a slightly different goal. The Precision Re-Entry Including Maneuvering Re-Entry Project, or PRIME, wanted to answer if it was possible for a lifting body to survive re-entry and actually maneuver from side to side. They also wanted to study if it was possible to make an acronym that used the same word twice without anyone noticing. Reentry maneuvers that deviate from a straight line require what's called cross-range capability. Prime flew at over 17,000 miles per hour and successfully demonstrated that such hypersonic cross-range capability was feasible, an important factor in developments to come. 
When I looked up photos of Asset and Prime, I realized I must have walked within a few feet of them when I visited the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. If only I'd known. With Prime complete, we find ourselves back at decision time in 1969 and 1970. And what have we got? We've got air-to-space-to-air control schemes, high angle of attack entry, detailed knowledge of the thermodynamics of re-entry, and cross-range capability. It sounds to me like we've got most of what we need for a space shuttle. There's just a few pieces of the puzzle left missing. NASA was close to getting the support it needed for the space shuttle, but it wasn't quite there yet. So it turned to a bigger, older relative who might be able to help out, the United States Air Force. NASA is the civilian space agency, but the Department of Defense does a ton of stuff in space. Reconnaissance satellites, missile early warning systems, communication satellites, the DoD needed all of this. NASA suggested that with Air Force support, they could both come out ahead. NASA would get much needed political clout for their next major post-Apollo project, and the Air Force would get cheaper launches. But it wasn't exactly a relationship between equals. NASA desperately wanted the space shuttle, but the Air Force, while interested, wasn't exactly beating down the doors of Congress to get it approved. They were perfectly happy with the Titan III launch vehicle. Sure, it was expensive, but they didn't really fly all that often, and you need to fly a lot to justify the development cost of a reusable spacecraft. But if NASA was willing to accept a few extra requirements, while still footing the bill, the Air Force might be willing to help out with their little, what did you call it, space shuttle? Sure, that thing. Among those requirements, perhaps the most dramatic was that the space shuttle be capable of deviating about 1,200 miles cross-range on entry. When legendary spacecraft designer Max Faget, who had played a central role in the design of Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, first took a stab at the shuttle, it had small, short wings, a lot like the X-15. You can actually see his original model on display at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex these days. Faget's wings wouldn't provide a lot of cross-range capability, only a few hundred miles, but they were simpler and presented a lot less material that required thermal protection. And NASA didn't really need that much cross-range capability for the kinds of missions it had in mind. NASA missions would launch east out of the Kennedy Space Center and mostly have a relatively low inclination. Even if the flight had to do a so-called once-around abort, where they re-entered after just one orbit, the limited cross-range capability would be just fine. That wasn't going to work for the Air Force. Reconnaissance satellites tend to fly in high-inclination polar orbits, covering as much ground as possible. These weren't allowed out of Florida, since the trajectory would carry the launch vehicle over populated areas. Instead, polar orbit missions launch south out of the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. The DoD had some crazy ideas about launching, deploying a satellite, or somehow even capturing an enemy satellite, and then landing back at Vandenberg after only one orbit. I'm not sure how anyone ever thought that was possible, but even without it, they still needed once-around abort capability. The problem is that if you leave California in a polar orbit, by the time you finish the orbit and come back to the launch site, the Earth will have rotated underneath you. That left California to the east by, oh hey, look at that, around 1,200 miles. If NASA wanted Air Force support, the shuttle needed to be capable of flying polar orbits. And if it was going to be capable of flying polar orbits, it would need a large delta wing to increase its cross-range capability. And that is how the space shuttle got its distinctive delta wing. The Air Force also exerted influence on the size of the vehicle itself. NASA was already planning a pretty wide payload bay to support a potential modular space station in the future. But DOD satellites, aka telescopes at point down, tended to be pretty long. Each organization grabbed an axis of the payload bay, pulled, and landed at the 15 by 60 foot dimensions that eventually flew. With the Air Force on board and providing the necessary political muscle, NASA finally got its wish in April of 1972, when Congress approved funding for the Space Shuttle, or more properly, the Space Transportation System. If that month sounds familiar, it's because funding was literally approved while John Young and Charlie Duke were kicking around the Descartes Highlands on Apollo 16. There's actually a great bit in an interview with Young, I think for the miniseries When We Left Earth, 
where he's asked if he remembered where he was when he heard the news. He just casually says something like, I think I was on the moon. Yeah, I was on the moon. John Young's great. Okay, awesome. So NASA's next big project has been officially greenlit. But what actually got greenlit? I talked a lot about political wrangling and meandered around some old space plane projects. But all I really told you about the shuttle was that it had a big delta wing and a 15 by 60 foot payload bay. But what was the vehicle actually like? What would it launch on? How is it going to survive re-entry and deliver on the promise of reusability? You'll find out next time as we cover the major components of the space transportation system. We'll get into the stage and a half concept, the external tank, the solid rocket boosters, all sorts of stuff about the orbiter spacecraft, and why they are the way they are. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. <laughs>